Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and a warm welcome to all of you. We have almost 100 participants joining us here today. Welcome um, to all of you. We are really, really excited to have you with us today. Um, thank you for joining us. We're really, really excited to have you here at our first virtual lab tour. Uh, my name is Collins. I work with Cancer Research Malaysia, and I will be your host this afternoon. We have some really interesting presentations lined up from the science team at the lab. Um, and I really hope you enjoy the show. Uh, do kindly note that this session is being recorded. You know, prior to this, before the coronavirus pandemic, the lockdown and everything that's been happening around us, Cancer Research Malaysia used to host lab tours for the public uh, periodically from time to time at our lab uh, where people could come and visit and experience what a real research lab feels like. Um, this has become a, a challenge, a challenge um, at a time where we are not able to open our doors to have so many people gathered um, at one spot at the same time. Uh, we really wanted to sort of explore the possibility of hosting such a tour virtually. Uh, and we really like to thank Kin Starfish Foundation and Vision Studio for working with us in developing this new virtual experience in hopes that we can now bring the lab to you um, at the comfort and safety of your home. Uh, the crew from Vision Studio has worked really hard to make this experience as immersive as it can be. And we really appreciate all the hard work that has been put in. Uh, thank you so much, KS, and the entire team at Vision Studio for all the effort and the hard work that's been done. Before we jump right in to the bulk of the program, we have a short video that we would like to show you to kind of set the scene. Uh, you will hear from some cancer survivors on their own experiences fighting against cancer and why uh, cancer research is important. I am a cancer survivor. I was diagnosed with um, adenoid cystic carcinoma nine years ago in 2010. Uh, I'm an ovarian cancer patient. 2010, I was diagnosed. I'm 80 years old now and uh, I'm a prostate cancer survivor. Um, I'm 29 years old. I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2015, in February. February 16th, yeah. February 16th, 2015, I was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer. Uh, I was first diagnosed with cancer in early 2017. Five years ago, Bukanisambusangino it was a devastating experience. I felt in total despair, totally lost, didn't know where to go for help. And when the pathology report came after my mastectomy, my whole world fell apart. Well, I was quite young when I had my cancer diagnosed. I was really shocked when I actually got to know the news because um, I've never met anyone my age at that point of time. I wanted to fight this disease. From there, I decided that yes, there is hope for me. And if I go through this treatment, I will continue to live life. I had the luxury of going through treatment and having like free medications pumped into me just to reduce all of my side effects. If I speak to patients that have gone through treatment 10 years ago, I noticed that treatments are very different from mine. If it weren't for cancer research, we wouldn't have developed the medications that we have now, the treatments that we have now. Cancer research is very important because when you have people to find out all this, you can find out what is actually problem with your mind. I'm glad that there is this Cancer Research Malaysia, you know, who's always doing research to find cures. Without research, there's no medical advance advancement. Like 40 years ago, out of four cancer patients, one would survive. But because of 
research. Today, out of two patients, one will survive. So it's thanks to research that less people are suffering. What if 40 years from now, because of your support, because of our support, cancer can be cured? Join the fight against cancer. So join the fight against cancer. Check out Cancer Research Malaysia. Support them. They need all the support that they can get. Join the fight against cancer and share this video. Uh, that was uh, indeed an interesting video um, and one that really set the scene for our program here today. Um, it's always really inspiring to hear the testimonials um, and the stories of hope uh, from cancer survivors. Um, I would now like to invite the CEO of Kin Holdings Berhad and the founder of Kin Starfish Foundation, uh, Chen Ping Kiat, or PK, as he's very fondly known by many. Uh, PK also serves as the director for Vistage in Mandarin, uh, and has been working closely with us at Cancer Research Malaysia for many years now. We are really thankful to be able to have you here with us today, um, despite your busy schedule. Uh, fun fact, uh, PK lives a really healthy lifestyle. Um, he has even published four books uh, to date, and, and he's become a vegetarian since 2010. Uh, welcome, PK. Hi, Dr. Colleen. <clears throat> um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to our first virtual lab tour. This visit is uh, co-organized by Cancer Research Malaysia and uh, Kin Starfish Foundation. We hosted a few physical labs visits previously. Uh, we were supposed to organize more such visits. However, the pandemic stopped us from doing so. Cancer affects every one of us. It has taken the life of our friends colleagues and family members. This year alone, four of my friends passed away because of cancer. Boon King is um, two years older than me, the rest of them younger. Boon King is my senior from my kampong, Sakin Chan. He died because of pancreatic cancer. Jasmine Yap and Li Hui died because of breast cancer. Both of them were in their late 40s. Vincent Chia, my beloved colleague who has served Kin, Kin Sabah for over 30 years, passed away uh, because of cancer too. Vincent was 57 years. All this happened during MCO. They will not, I mean, they will not be able to celebrate Chinese New Year with us next year. Premature death is devastating to their families. Their early departure could have been avoided if they were cures. I'm sure um, you too have lost friends, family members, and acquaintances due to big C. Yeah? Can we do anything? Certainly we can, although we are not doctors or scientists. We can support doctors and scientists to fight cancer by supporting them in cancer research. The purpose of this lab tour is to create awareness about cancer, cancer prevention, cancer research, and how can we support Cancer Research Malaysia? I think most of us know too little about cancer. Many businesses' activity can stop during MCO, but not cancer research work. There is urgency for the scientists to find vaccine and cures to prevent and to fight cancers. The earlier they can find the solution, the more strategies could be avoided. Cancer Research Malaysia has been in cancer research work for the last 20 years, and they have many breakthroughs in their work. Later, Professor Teo, Janet, or other scientists will share with you their achievements and breakthrough in cancer research. Cancer research is not easy, but necessary. The failure rate is very high. It takes many years to develop the cures. Because of cancer research effort over the last many years, um, we now have better survival rate. Many years ago, only one in four survived over 10 years. Today, one in two, which is 50% of the cancer patient, can live over 10 years. We hope one day we can continue to see higher survival rate. It is possible that cancer will no longer be a death sentence. Ladies and gentlemen, this is only possible if, if we invest into medical research like cancer research. 
Do you know that cancer is racist? Different type of cancer will affect different race. This is due to the difference in DNA, diet, lifestyle, and also culture. Cancer that affect Asians is different from those that affect Caucasians. Unfortunately, most scientific research for cancer are mainly done in US and Europe, and they focus in cancer that affect the Caucasians, not Asians. Hence, laser cure or vaccine have been discovered or developed for Asian patients. That means the survival rate for Asian cancer patients is lower. Cancer research labs like Cancer Research Malaysia help to fill in the gap. We urgently need to find cures that affect Asians, especially Malaysians. Some might doubt our ability in cancer research. Can we Malaysian undertake such complicated and advanced medical research? I didn't believe it too until I visited Cancer Research Malaysia in 2015. That visage changed my view about our ability in cancer research, and hence, Kent King Starfish Foundation has decided to support Cancer Research Malaysia since then. In the last few years, King Starfish Foundation has organized three large-scale fundraising and cancer awareness events, bold and beautiful. Thanks to the support of many, we have raised almost 4 million ringgits for Cancer Research Malaysia and a few other organizations that support cancer patients. I'm happy to announce that the contribution made by us to Cancer Research Malaysia has been put for good use and, and produced remarkable results. We have helped to save life. Today, we bring to you to the lab to see and understand how our scientists work behind the scenes. They have been working days and night to look for solutions that save life millions of life. I'm certain that this visit will enhance your understanding about cancer, uh, the threat that affects every one of us. Before I conclude my, my speech, I would like to take the opportunity to thank those that are involved in preparing for this visit. <clears throat> this is many months of hard work and dedications. First, I would like to thank KS Du from Vision, uh, Vision Studio and his dedicated team of production crews for helping to shoot the video, give technical support, and getting us ready for today's visit. And also thanks to CRM teams for putting in effort despite their very busy schedule in preparing for the event. Without them, it is not possible to organize this event. And of course, we also thanks all the participants for joining us today. Um, without you, there is no show. Please stay with us until the end. I'm sure you will learn a lot more about cancer, the causes of cancer, cancer prevention, cancer research, and cure. I'm sure you'll be touched by the efforts made by our scientists from Cancer Research Malaysia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, PK, for those kind words and for sharing your experience with us. Uh, we are indeed very grateful for all the support that we have received from you and the Kin Starfish Foundation. It's always a pleasure to be able to work with you and your team. Um, and we continue, we hope to be able to continue to work together uh, in the fight against cancer, uh, reversing the big C into a small one. I would now like to introduce our next speaker, uh, CEO of Cancer Research Malaysia, Janet Yap. Janet oversees the creation, implementation, and integration of the strategic direction for the organization. She has had over 20 years of experience in the corporate world and also serves as a trustee of World Vision Malaysia and as a non-executive director for OCBC Bank Malaysia. Welcome, Janet. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Um, so I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you who have joined us in this uh, virtual world nowadays uh, to uh, experience a, a virtual lab tour with us. Um, very much uh, thank you to uh, spending your uh, being agreeable to spending your time uh, together with us. Uh, I also like to express uh, thank you to uh, PK for his uh, support all these years and uh, very strong encouragement as well as uh, financial and advisory support as well in, in the work that we do. So thank you very much uh, PK and the team from uh, Kin Starfish Foundation and also to uh, KS Du from Visual Studios for all the hard work in uh, uh, enabling this video. Uh, we, 
live in actually strange times nowadays, and I'm pretty sure you've, you've heard this uh, in, in many, many uh, occasions as well, uh, in terms of the new normal and the work that we do. Um, if I were to look at it from a pandemic perspective, what, are, what is the one silver lining that we can extract out of it? And it, it would be that at least now, everybody understands the importance of research, the importance of science, uh, even from young kids to grandparents, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone talks about, is the vaccine ready, right? Uh, and is there a cure? And, and uh, what's the research status, status like? So uh, the, the awareness of uh, science research, the importance of research and the importance of vaccines and solutions for diseases, uh, it's high on everyone's mind. Uh, and, uh, and even more so when we look at long-term diseases like cancer that is affecting everyone. Um, I would like to share a little bit in terms of the background of Cancer Research Malaysia. I know some of you in, in the uh, audience are, are long-term friends of, of Cancer Research Malaysia, and this is probably uh, old news to you, but I, I'm also seeing that we have many new friends that have joined us uh, in this uh, virtual session, and I would like to uh, uh, talk a little bit about the background of, of uh, how we got started and uh, where we are. So let me share my screen, and uh, hopefully you can see it pretty soon. Okay, so a quick introduction uh, in terms of uh, where we are. Um, so the stats is we are almost half of the world's cancer cases in terms of Asians, but we are less than 10% of the research, right? So 20 years ago, um, with statistics like this, um, Yang Mak Mulia Tunku Ahmad went to Cambridge and extracted a young scientist, right? And they decided to start the organization. At that time, it was called CARIF, C-R-I-F. Uh, but now it's been renamed to Cancer Research Malaysia. And the intention is to look at all the stats and look at all the research and see what we can do to focus cures and therapies for Asians, right? The priority is to ensure Asians are not left out in the fight against cancer. But in addition to that, uh, the, the call to action at that time was also that it will be a non-profit organization so that we can benefit all levels of people in Asia, especially Malaysians, right? And we can focus on the areas that are affecting Asians uh, and especially Malaysians in all, across all the communities. So the goal is to have a vision of a future free from the fear of cancer, right? So there will be fewer cases, uh, maybe earlier stages of detection and definitely improved survival rates. And this is really intention is to provide hope for patients and for families specifically for Asian patients and Asian families. Right? Uh, we are entirely funded by a uh, charity. We are funded by people who decide to sponsor us um, and run fundraising events for us, for example, Kin Starfish. Uh, we are sponsored by the likes of Petronas and Saim Darby as well for certain areas. And we have also got grants from certain academics and institutions around the world. But these are few and far between. And as you know, the um, the future is very much focused on a lot of different charities because of where we are now. So uh, everyone is being affected in terms of the uh, funds that, are, that we are able to raise. Uh, we are also uh, very rigorously reviewed by a scientific advisory board consisting of luminaries from Oxford and Cambridge and around the world um, so that our research is really uh, reliable, steady and world-class. So as a PK mentioned before, the goal is really to uh, increase the survival rates over the years, right? um, from one in four to two in four, and hopefully three in four in, in, in the years to come, and maybe even more than that in different areas of cancer. So um, I wanna talk a little bit, but this will be explained in more detail as, a, as a, when the scientists talk through all the different projects that we have. Um, we are, the first country in Asia to provide genetic risk counseling to ovarian cancer patients, right? Uh, we, are, we have the world's largest genetic database of Asian breast cancers. And why is that important? Well, stay tuned and you will listen. You will hear and understand why uh, when the scientists talk through it, right? We are also the leading in Asian research for two major breast cancer genetic studies. Again, stay tuned. Now, I have an Akan Datang uh, slide, but actually some of it already Sudah Datang, right? 
we have we are launching a lot of clinical trials for treatment for effective treatment options, and there, there are some exciting news that will be coming your way in terms of some of the first clinical trials that we will be uh, doing uh, in, in the world. We have a risk a breast cancer risk calculator right for Asian women, and we are working on an AI app. Now this is a version probably version two point two already to help detect oral cancer. So I'll share a, a fun fact with you. Um, Early part of this year, I do not, I did not know much about Cancer Research Malaysia. Sometime in, I think January or February, I had a occasion to have a chat with uh, Professor Teo. Right? She's our Chief Scientist Officer in Cancer Research Malaysia. And uh, we were talking about the things that uh, she was working on, she and the team was working on in Cancer Research Malaysia. And uh, five hours later, and a lot of science later, I was so keen that I decided to join the company. So I, I am very, uh, very new to Cancer Research Malaysia. I just joined in March this year, but I'm very excited to look at all the things we are doing. And I'm very excited to look at all the things that we would be doing with all your support and with the support of all our, sp our sponsors. So uh, we would journey through this together in terms of the work that CRMY will do uh, in, the, in the months and years to come. Lastly, um, I want to, I wanted to talk a bit about our achievements, but I know these are all slides and, and flat data, right? Uh, I would much rather that you meet the people that actually won all these awards and uh, do, did all these achievements. And there are actually a couple more slides that I could have shown you with achievements, but I think it would be much more engaging if you have an opportunity to listen to them and at the end of the session to ask them questions as well. Uh, so I would, uh, without further ado, I would pass it back to Collins for you to meet most of our scientists. Thank you for your time. Um, thank you, Janet, for the <clears throat> introduction to the organization and the presentation. Uh, we are going to begin with the scientific portion shortly. Uh, but before we jump right in, I would just like to highlight that uh, we are indeed accepting questions from the public. And so if you have any questions that you would like to ask any of the speakers, please do type it out in the question and answer box below. Um, I would like to now invite our next speaker, uh, Datin Paduka, Professor Dr. Teo Su Huang, OBE, who is the Chief Scientific Officer at Cancer Research Malaysia. Prof. Su is the founding CEO of the organization and was awarded the Honorary Officer of the Order of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth II in 2018 for her services to medical research. She is the only female scientist in living memory to have won the award in Malaysia. She's also an adjunct professor at the University of Malaya and is a fellow of the Academy of Sciences. Welcome, Prof. Dio. Thank you very much, Collins. Thank you to um, everyone for coming to attend this session. And in particular, thank you to PK and, um, and KS and team for all your help in making this possible. So today, what I'm going to talk, talk to you about is really about cancer. So I'm going to ask Ken to first share my slides so that you can see what I'm going to be talking about. So we know that there's about probably about 6 million people, maybe a little bit more that live in the Klang Valley, right? 6 million people live in the Klang Valley and all currently under lockdown. Imagine three times the size of the Klang Valley, 18 million people, three times the size of the Klang Valley uh, will be told this year that they have been diagnosed with cancer. 18 million people this year will be diagnosed with cancer and 9.6 million, or just under 10 million people, are going to die of cancer this year. That's somewhere in the world. So next slide, please. Imagine you are that person. Imagine you have cancer. What will be going through your mind? I know if I was told these three words, you have cancer, I would be thinking, how much time do I have? How much will I suffer? And increasingly, how much will it cost? How much will it cost? me or my family? What are the consequences of having cancer? Next slide, please. Imagine a different future. Imagine a future in which you're told cancer is cured. Cancer is an affordably controlled chronic disease. Instead of one in which half of the cancer patients die of the disease, it's one in which it is a curable disease. Is this possible? Well, for some cancers, it's already achieved. For testicular cancer, for example, it's about a 96% cure rate. 
for some types of leukemia, it's almost a 95% cure rate. For breast cancer detected in the early stage, it's already a 90% cure rate. For cervical cancer at the early stage, it's also more than a 90% cure rate. So already for some cancers, it's already possible that cancer is cured. This is possible. But what's the challenge? The challenge is cancer is 200 different diseases. And we're not there yet for all diseases. Cancer is 200 different diseases, but for some diseases, it continues to present at late stage. And as a consequence, we're not able to cure it because it's presenting at a late stage. So what do we need to do? Next slide, please. Well, what we need to do is really continue to take this journey of progress. PK already mentioned it. Jared in the video already mentioned it. And uh, Janet in her speech earlier already mentioned it that we must continue to make improvements. How did we get one in four to survive 10 years in 1970? Actually, the biggest progress was advances in surgery because it was possible to operate and operate more, more accurately. We're able to ensure that one in four cancer patients were able to survive 10 years. But the advances from 1970 to 2010 was mostly because of radiotherapy and chemotherapy and further improvements in early detection of cancer. All of that together is not one solution, and it's not just the development of new therapies. It's actually the development of many different things, many different aspects of cancer, many different uh, aspects for many different types of cancers that enabled us to overall improve survival from one in four surviving 10 years to two in four surviving 10 years. What do we need to do to make it even better than what it was? You know, some of you will be looking at this number and thinking, are you so slow? Why is it that we're taking so long? Well, the, the reason why it's taking so long is because cancer is not like any other disease. Cancer is a disease that arises from within ourselves. So if you think about a disease like COVID, COVID is an external disease. It's caused by a virus that's external, right? Uh, the flu is an external disease. Bacteria are all external diseases. So when you want to deal with an external disease, you find out what's different about that external disease and you create a vaccine that can help boost your immune system to fight the external disease. But cancer is not an external disease. Cancer is an internal disease. Cancer arises because the cells in our own human body have changed in their characteristics. Next slide, please. So the biggest discovery that we have in a generation on what is cancer is that cancer is a genetic disease. Cancer arises from our own normal cells. And when our own normal cells acquire genetic changes, they, they divide or they start to grow when they're not supposed to grow. So our cells normally grow when they're supposed to grow. So for example, if you fall down and cut yourself in the knee, your skin cells will start to divide to replace the skin cells that were brushed off when you fell down. But there's, once it's filled up that hole, that your cells stop growing, they don't grow anymore. And that's because your, your body has self-regulation methods that enable your body and your cells to stop growing when it's supposed to stop. It's just supposed to make ngam ngam just nice, and then it stops growing. But what happens in cancers is that they ignore these signals because of the genetic changes that have taken place in those cells. They ignore all these signals to stop growing and they just keep growing and growing and growing. They manage to have a different way of evading the immune system. So normally the immune system would come along and kill those cancer cells before it has the chance to grow too big. And in fact, if none of us had an immune system, all of us would get cancer by the time we're 15 years old. So let me repeat that. If none of us had an immune system, all of us, we get cancer by the time we're 15 years old. But the reason why we fewer of us get cancer is because we have such an immune system. And our immune system is very good at seeking out cancers that are at cells which have gone abnormal and growing into cancer cells. But in cancer patients, sometimes the, immune, the cancer cells have been able to evade or escape from the immune, uh, from the immune system. And as a consequence, they can grow uncontrolled. So that means that cancer is an internal disease. It's not an external disease that's caused by viruses and bacteria. 
but it's an internal disease that's caused by changes that take place in our cells. So some of these cancers, the genetic changes are caused by the viruses. And I'll come back to this in a short while. So what can we do with this information that cancer is a genetic disease? Next slide, please. So in some individuals, what we know is that because some individuals don't have an ability to repair the damage to cells that take place all the time, they are more likely to get cancer. So by far the most famous person who inherited a gene that gives them more likely to get cancer is Angelina Jolie. Angelina Jolie is only one in a million, one in a billion maybe. You know, she's a very famous actress and her Hollywood movies sell like crazy, like hotcakes, right? But she's one in a billion in terms of being a Hollywood star. But when it comes to being inheriting a genetic alteration, she's actually not that, not that unusual. If you think about the, the, the Asian population, out of the 650 million Southeast Asians, 650 million Southeast Asians, we estimate that at least um, half a million, 500,000 Southeast Asians have exactly the same genetic alteration as Angelina Jolie. What would happen if in the future, instead of just Angelina Jolie being able to prevent cancer, we could make that available for all 500,000 500, Southeast Asians that inherit the same gene. You know, we may not be able to have a bread pit all by our sides, but at least if we are empowered by the information that we have about a genetic test, we can offer prevention to those at high risk, we can offer screening to those at moderate risk, and perhaps we can save money for the healthcare system, for our Ministry of Health, if we don't offer screening at all to those individuals at low risk, because the screening benefit is less than the screening harm. But the other aspect of cancer genetics is that because cancers arise by cells that have acquired genetic changes, this means that cancers, each cancer acquires different genetic changes. So some individuals might acquire a genetic change in gene A and they require treatment A. Other individuals have a genetic change in, in gene B and they require treatment B. And third group of individuals may have a genetic change in gene C and they require a different drug, gene C. So in the past, what we, the way we looked at cancers was we looked at it according to geography. What I meant by that is, if you have breast cancer, I give you treatment A. If you have colon cancer, I give you treatment B. And if you have brain cancer, I give you treatment C. But because of what we now know at the genetic level, this is now no longer how we approach cancer. How we approach cancer is to ask at the genetic level, what are the similarities? What is the thing that drives this cancer to become a cancer cell from a normal cell? And use that information to treat cancers. That basically means that some breast cancer patients will have the treatment that's the same as other breast cancer patients. But other breast cancer patients would have treatments that is more like an ovarian cancer patient. Other breast cancer patients may have a treatment that's more like a brain cancer patient. So in other words, the choice of treatment is not dictated just by the geography of where the cancer arises, but by an understanding of what's actually happened in the cell of the, uh, the patient that makes that particular cell a cancer cell. Next slide, please. But all of the research that we have done has shown us that prevention of cancer, that cancer is potentially the most preventable of all non-communicable diseases. You'll be really surprised to hear this, right? That cancer is potentially the most preventable of all non-communicable diseases. So let's think about this a little bit. We know that heart disease is very common. How are you going to prevent heart disease? We know that diabetes is very common, but how do you prevent diabetes? So the reality is cancer today has got four big ways of prevention. Number one, tobacco. Tobacco alone accounts for one third of the cancer cases in Malaysia. Vaccination, if we can vaccinate everyone against hepatitis B, the human papilloma virus, and so on, we may be able to prevent another 20% of cancers. If we all had better diets, if we could all do what PK does and be a vegetarian, PK amazingly has been a vegetarian for the past 10 years. If we are all vegetarians, we would significantly reduce our risk of cancer. And we're all more physically active, we would also be able to reduce our risk of cancer. 
So all in all, for all the cancers in the world, about half, 30% to half of the cancers could be prevented if we all had to less tobacco, more vaccinations, a better diet and greater physical activity. But prevention doesn't apply to all cancers. Unfortunately, today, two of the most common cancers, breast cancer and prostate cancer, are 90% unpreventable. I know that's really depressing news, right? Because this is the cancer that our friends, our colleagues, our mothers, our fathers are being affected by, breast and prostate cancer. So next slide, please. So how are we going to do prevention of cancer? Well, to be able to do prevention of cancer, we need to divide it into three different groups. On the left are the cancers that are caused primarily by a hereditary component. And you'll see that the darker the color, the more likely it is that that cancer is caused by a hereditary component. So what we can see here is that actually it's only cancer of the ovary, stomach, pancreas, breast, and colon, where uh, the genetic component, the inherited component, is about one in five for ovarian cancer, one in 20 for breast cancer, one in 25 for colorectal cancer. So in the individuals that have inherited a gene, it's very important that they know their status so that they can undergo prevention. But this is very rare. What we need to do more about is the ones on the right. The ones in the right are the cancers that are infected by the environment. So you'll see the esophageal cancer, you'll see lung cancer, you'll see liver cancer, you'll see cervical cancer. Lung, head and neck, cervical, esophageal cancer, they're all 90% preventable. And what we need to do for these is what I put at the table at the bottom. Avoid radiation, avoid chemical carcinogens, avoid tumor-causing viruses, avoid bad lifestyle such as smoking and so on. But what about the ones in the middle, the one I have put in the box? Unfortunately, there are many cancers in here. Things like brain cancer, pancreatic cancer, bone cancer. Unfortunately for many of those, it is really currently unpreventable. And the main driver for these is many different factors. And the main driver is that when cells are dividing normally, they just acquire a genetic change. And just by bad luck, sometimes that genetic change occurs in a gene that can cause the cancer to develop. Next slide, please. But today, based on the understanding that we have that cancer is a genetic disease, we've now identified many approaches that can hit cancer's weakest points. We can use hormones. So for example, in breast cancer and prostate cancer, the use of hormones or anti-hormonal factors are very important in being able to cure the cancers. We can use our ability to attack cancer cells because cancer cells are growing quickly. And by using chemotherapy, we're able to make sure that we kill the cancer cells that are growing quickly without affecting normal cells that are growing usually much more slowly. But more importantly, we know that cancer cells use different signaling pathways, controlling pathways to be able to tell the cells to divide when they're not supposed to. And if we can use the drugs that block this proliferation, we can also develop better ways of curing cancer. And finally, what I'm most excited about is about the immune system. You're going to hear a lot more about the immune system from Fei later, about why the immune system is critical in the fight against cancer and how new therapies that target the immune system are really holding new promise in our ability to be able to cure cancer. Next. Uh, that looks really simple, right? Just four little things. But to a scientist, it's not quite that simple. There are more than 10 different pathways that are abrogated or that are damaged when uh, normal cells in your human body become abnormal cancer cells and grow out of control. And these, fortunately, there are now many different targeted therapies that are being developed that hit, hits each one of these cancer weak points. So in other words, by understanding how cancers are different from normal cells, we can develop better drugs that hopefully will kill the cancer cells without killing the normal cells. Because the whole point of cancer therapy is not to kill cancer cells. It's to kill cancer cells, but not kill the patient. Next slide, please. So this is what happens when we succeed, when we find a targeted therapy that works. On the left in A is a patient with advanced melanoma. And in B is the same patient that is then treated with a targeted therapy. So even when the cancer has been spread systemically, it can be controlled if we can identify the genetic marker and have a drug that effectively improves that survival. 
And on the right, I just show you two survival curves. Apologies, this is what scientists and medics look at all the time, but it just shows you what happens in terms of improving survival. And what we can do in this is be able to significantly improve survival for breast cancer patients and for lung cancer patients when we have the targeted therapy that specifically hits the weak points in the cancer cells. Next slide. So because of cancer research, more and more patients will survive cancer. And, you know, many people look at me and say, oh, you must be such a depressing person because, you know, cancer research is 99.99% perspiration and frustration and 0.001% success. It is true, but it's for that 0.001% success that all of the scientists and doctors work so hard to find a cure for cancer. Because if we stop the work that we do today, then there's never going to be any advances in the fight against cancer. Next slide, please. So what's the atrocity? Earlier you hit this number, that Asians make up only 10% of the research today. Why is that? Why do we make up only 10% of the research? Well, for the simple reason that until very recently, most of the technology was in the West. So if you think about the best universities in the world, there'll be Harvard, Cambridge, Oxford, Mayo, they're all in the West. They're all in North America and in Europe. So in those centers, they would have the infrastructure, the laboratory to do the research. And therefore, they would only do research on the patients that they can get access to, right? In addition to that, it's also one in which of resources. If you only have 100 oncologists in this country, how are you going to do any research if they're so busy dealing with 40,000 patients? Let me repeat that. There are just over 100 oncologists in this country, and they deal with 40,000 newly diagnosed cancer patients every year. Mayo, um, MD Anderson, one of the biggest centers in the US, also deals with about 30 to 40,000, just one cancer center, also deals with 30 to 40,000 cancer patients every year. But guess how many oncologists they have just on their teaching faculty? 1,700. So we have 100 oncologists, they have 1,700 lecturers and professors. We're just not talking about the more junior people. So the reality is because our country has, doesn't yet have the university setups that are working actively in cancer research, because we've never had the funding to set this up, because our doctors are so busy fighting fires, we don't have, we have not invested in cancer research. Asians only make up 10% of the research today. Next slide, please. So what are the consequences of that? Well, the consequences, we are already living it today. 70% of the deaths due to cancer occur in low and middle income countries. So even though only 50% of the, of the cancer cases occur in low and middle income countries, 70% of the deaths occur in our part of the world. By 2030, it's going to increase to potentially more than 80%. And Asians today already make up a lot of the death. For stomach cancer, it's already three in four. For liver cancer, it's already three in four. For breast cancer, it's already five in 10. So even though an Asian woman has half the risk of breast cancer compared to a Caucasian woman, so Caucasian American women has a one in nine chance of developing breast cancer, Malaysian women only have a 1 in 20 chance of developing breast cancer. But their survival in the US is 80%, and our survival in Malaysia is 63%. So the reality is, unless we do more to improve survival in cancer for our part of the world, we're going to be left behind. Next slide. So Cancer Research Malaysia really set out to ask this question. Are there racial differences? Is it necessary to do the research? Given that cancer research is so expensive, we must first ask ourselves, is it worth it? Surely for every dollar that we can get from charity, we should go and help all the needy patients today. Absolutely, we should certainly help cancer patients today. And I encourage every one of us to please reach out and help cancer patients today because they have a terrible journey in front of them. But if we only reach out to the cancer patients in front of us, we'll, ne we'll need more and more money be able to help those. We're not finding sustainable solutions. We need to be able to find, in a sense, like the adage, it's not enough to teach someone, to, to give someone a fish. It's much more important to teach them how to fish. 
So it's important for us to fundamentally ask this question. Are there racial differences between cancers? And what must we do in order to improve survival for cancers in our part of the world? Next slide, please. So there are three differences. The first is we have different genes. Different genes means that we may have a different risk to disease and a different response to treatment. And I've been really privileged to lead a study that has now become the largest Asian study on breast cancer. And in this largest Asian study of breast cancer, we've been able to show how Asian genetics is different from Caucasian genetics. We've used that information to help us design a new treatment, a new clinical trial for Asian patients. And as of yesterday, five patients have already taken part in this new clinical trial, examining how immunotherapy it may be beneficial. Immunotherapy that was initially developed for melanoma patients, skin cancer patients and lung cancer patients may benefit Asian breast cancer patients because of the differences in their genetic profiles. I never dreamt that this was possible. I really set up to just ask the question, can we do more research in Asians? But to be able to take it all the way from a discovery, from setting up a patient cohort, to analyzing those, to setting up a clinical trial and taking it forward, has only been possible because of a lot of our donors and a fantastic team of scientists. Often I'm just a spokesperson, but it's a fantastic team of doctors and scientists behind the scene that make it possible for us to pursue this journey. But we're not stopping just at genes. We now know that because the immune profiles are different, it must be driven by something else. So we're starting to explore how is it that our diet may be involved. So for example, some of you may know that we're doing Malaysia's first cancer prevention trial, examining whether drinking soya bean, soya, soya drink, can reduce your risk of breast cancer. But habits can also increase our risk of cancer. So for example, eating a lot of salted food and preserved food is associated with an increased risk of nasopharyngeal cancer. And nasopharyngeal cancer is one of the most common cancers among the BDIU people. They have the highest risk in the world. But our beliefs also changes not just our, our likelihood of getting cancer, but also our response to treatment and our survivability from cancer. So next slide. So how are we going to do this? So I give you as one example. This is really our flagship program. Oral cancer is our flagship program. We started uh, oral cancer research because the reason Cancer Research Malaysia started was Tan Sri Tunku Ahmad Yahya, then the deputy chairman of Saim Dabi Berhad, came to call on me uh, as a Yayasan Saim Dabi scholar in Cambridge to ask me, um, to ask me whether it would be possible to do any research on oral cancer. Because he had been approached by his former university in Bristol to say that they were working on oral cancer, but they couldn't find any money because it wasn't a common cancer in that part of the world. So they asked Tunku, can you raise money in Malaysia as a corporate leader, as a business leader? Can you raise money in Malaysia to support this oral cancer group in Bristol? And Tunku, being a very, very loyal Malaysian, said, of course, I want to support cancer research because it affects my part of the world. It affects my people. But can I please do this in Malaysia? So can I set up the organization in Malaysia to be able to do this? So oral cancer is really the flagship program of why Cancer Research Malaysia set up. And because of the leadership of Prof Chong Sok Cheng and many others within the team, we've been able to make milestones in this program. And so for today, is, is our first virtual lab tour. We're only going to talk about oral cancer and the work that we're doing with oral cancer. Hopefully, if we're able to organize more of these webinars in the future, we'll tell you more about the work that we're doing in breast cancer. So why oral cancer? You can see in dark blue are where oral cancer is more common. It's more common in Asia. And for those of you with very sharp eyes, you'll see that Australia is in dark blue, right? How come Australia has got oral cancer? Well, actually, the way the uh, World Health Organization calls oral cancer is they also call lip cancer oral cancer. But this is wrong. Lip cancer is actually a type of skin cancer. So in, in Australia, what they call oral cancer is actually lip cancer, whereas the cancer that occurs in Taiwan, uh, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Indonesia, these are all cancers inside your mouth, oral cancer. Next. 
because oral cancer is more common in our part of the world, it causes a lot more cancer-related deaths. So nearly one in 10 cancer deaths in, the, in Southeast Asia is because of oral cancer. And this is compared to just one in 20 cancer deaths in other parts of the world. Next slide, please. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, what I would like to do about it is to have a mountain of affordable drugs. This is my dream, that every cancer drug is only, only cost one ringgit. So that by having affordable drugs, we can be able to treat cancers more effectively rather than the situation today where every drug is so expensive, even if it was already developed, it's really not accessible to the majority of patients. This is a dream that we all have. We all want a mountain, a very big mountain of generic drugs, drugs that are available much cheaper. How are we gonna get there? The reality is that every drug that is being developed and marketed in the market today costs 2 billion US dollars to develop. 2 billion US dollars to develop. It's so expensive. Which government is gonna put up the 2 billion US dollars necessary to develop one drug, especially with the high failure rate? Who's going to do that? So the reality is that governments and society have made a contract, an unspoken contract with the pharmaceutical industry. We tell the pharmaceutical industry, you go and invest in developing new drugs. And when you discover a new drug, we give you 20 years of protected time under a patent so that you can charge whatever you need to, to make the money so that you can fund more, more research to develop more drugs in the future, right? So this race is on at the moment to find a COVID vaccine because if you are the first in developing a COVID vaccine, you have a protected time to be able to sell it at a very big price and hopefully make a lot of money that then funds further research. But the reality is things need to go into the pipeline in the first place. So unknown to many people, what actually funds the input for this research that creates the drugs that makes it possible for the pharma company to take it to clinical trials is actually research that's funded by governments, research that's funded by foundations, research that's founded by the Bill Gates Foundations, research that's founded by many charitable donations, venture cap, for example, to bring it to market. So what's the challenge? The challenge is for a cancer like oral cancer that is common in our part of the world, a poor man's disease, no one is ever going to fund that research. We have to fund it ourselves if we're going to be proved the outcome. Next slide. So this is what cancer research does. Our mission is to save lives through impactful research in Asians. We want to prevent more cancers like our MISO trial with soy. We want to diagnose cancers early, for example, through the detection of BRCA carriers in our MAGIC study. We want to treat cancers more effectively. And you'll hear today what we're doing in developing immunotherapy and using gene editing technology to identify new drugs. And ultimately, we want to improve quality of life, which is what we're doing through our patient navigation program. I wish I can tell you, if you stay with me, I can tell you for the next three days, all the work that we're doing in cancer research. But I'm, I, I'm mindful that there's so much complexity. It's really important to just perhaps leave you with vignettes, just two examples of the work that we do. Next slide, please. So today, I'm just gonna be able to tell you about two projects. In our oral cancer program, Sokching, Kuiping and team have been leading in the development of an oral cancer vaccine. This is not the type of vaccine that prevents the cancer from happening, but it's one a, can, a vaccine that helps to boost the patient's immune system so that when cancer recurs, it can get rid of it. It can be a therapeutic vaccine, a slightly different way of using vaccines. We're using drug repurposing and gene editing technology to identify new therapies for oral cancer. And what I won't have time to tell you about today will be our work in breast cancers, creating genomic maps, creating new profiles and taking it to clinical trial. This work was funded by a number of different people like Scientex, like Estee Lauder group of companies, like Kin Starfish Foundation. Kin Starfish Foundation raised money that enabled us to start Malaysia's first investigator initiated start trial. What this means is this is the first trial that is based entirely on Asian profiles. We set up Asian cohorts for genetic tests and are using it for effect efficient screening 
we are looking at, we're doing a lot of research on how people behave, how they make decisions, so that we develop new tools that help us implement and improve the survival for cancer patients. So we have to make sure that we're backed by the most important and the most credible governance systems. And everyone knows I'm a terrible boss. I'm a really tough boss to work with. But that's because we have very high standards, because we take the responsibility of using charitable money very, very seriously. So we ask the best scientists in the world, professors in Cambridge, in Oxford, in Merdeka Award winners in University of Malaya, potentially board members in the International Union Against Cancer, um, professors from Duke National Cancer Center in Singapore to help us the direct how our research should be done in order to make sure that whatever little money that we can get to do cancer research, we spend it to the best of our ability. And we really want to hold out an umbrella to a lot of people who have lost a lot loved ones to cancer. We need to help them when they're suffering from cancer. But because the number of cancer cases are going to increase in the future, we don't have enough umbrellas. We're not going to have enough umbrellas to hold out in front of the people who are suffering. We need to do more to find sustainable solutions. And so the Syme Darbys and patronuses of this world are absolutely critical because Syme Darby supports close to 65% of our staff salary costs. Patronus supports close to 80% of our operational costs. But we need to still find a gap. We need to find a gap for the 35% salary costs, the 20% operational costs, and we need to find money for the research costs, all of the consumables, the chemicals that we use, and so on. Next slide, please. So I'm appealing to everyone, really, to help us build a future free of the fear of cancer. Many people often ask me, why did I choose a vision that's so hard to, to say, a future free of the fear of cancer? Sometimes I'll do a naughty thing and ask you, how many Fs are there in this sentence? Because you might not be able to see it. But why a future free of the fear of cancer rather than a future free of cancer? Well, I think I'll be lying to you if I, can, if I believe that there's a future free of cancer. Because cancer is only half preventable. And the reality is that we're going to have to buy, find better treatments for the other half. But if we imagine a future in which all cancer is cured, that future is one in which we don't have a fear of cancer. In the same way as we may not have a fear of diabetes or a fear of high cholesterol, because we know what we can do about it. So join me in this journey. There are many things that you can do in this journey with us. It only starts with one. What I do, I mean by one. It starts with one gesture, one move, and it really doesn't take that much. There are four things that we look for within Cancer Research Malaysia. Give us your time, give us your talent. Next slide. Give us your treasures. And if you can't, give us your touch. Help us reach out to other individuals that may be able to help us. Um, thank you, Prof Tio, <clears throat> for the overview and the introduction. Um, I would now like to invite Dr. Kui Ping to begin her presentation on cancer immunotherapy. Uh, Dr. Kui Ping is the team lead of the cancer immunotherapy team at Cancer Research Malaysia. Her research has focused on understanding the immune system of cancer patients and the development of novel immunotherapies to treat cancer. Welcome, Dr. Kui Ping. Hi, I'm Kui Ping. I'm going to tell you the effort in Cancer Research Malaysia trying to develop cancer immunotherapy as a new therapies option for cancer patients in Malaysia. So what is cancer immunotherapy? It's actually basically to use your immune system to fight against cancer. So the pictures illustrated here are different immune cells that are present in your body. We can actually utilise one of them or different type of them to fight against cancer. And worth to note that immune system is always in a balance between activations and suppressions. Or in a simple term, there are two components that present in your car are very similar to the immune system, which is the brake system and your accelerator. So normally when your car is moving too fast, you will step on the brake to slow it down. And when your car is moving too slow, you will step on the accelerator to speed it up. The same thing happened in immune system. So immune activation was actually your accelerator and immune suppression was actually your brake system. These two systems always present in a very balanced situation so that your car was always travel in a permitted speed limit or your immune system are not overly activated. 
But sadly to know that in most of the cancer patients, the activation part was actually being suppressed, means cancer patient would not be able to activate the immune system to fight against cancer. Or the break part is always activated, means there's always a stop, stopping point for your immune system to fight back the cancer. So what in cancer immunotherapy trying to do is, we try to make sure that immune activation is elevated and suppression is being decreased by utilising different drugs. For example, the use of checkpoint inhibitors will be able to remove the break of immune system and the use of cancer vaccine adoptive cell transfer will be able to boost your immune activation. And the next question you will ask, SIMS is very new to me. Will, immune, or will cancer immunotherapy work to treat cancer? Let me give you two very renowned examples of using cancer immunotherapy in treating cancers. So this is Emily. Emily was actually having leukemia when she was only five years old in 2010. So in 2011, her cancer actually relapsed and she resisted to all types of chemotherapy. Her doctors actually think that her cancer are too aggressive and she ran out of any treatment options and asked her to go home for hospice treatment. And she's luckily enough to enroll in the first ever CAR T cells clinical trial in 2012. And now, Emily is actually cured from cancers. This year, 2020, was actually Emily eight years free of cancer. Another example was actually from President Jimmy Carter. President was actually diagnosed with melanoma that already spread to the liver and brain when he is 91 years old. So normally when a patient is 91 years old having a metastatic cancer, the normal approach is the patient will undergo palliative care. But President Jimmy Carter was actually enrolled in the clinical trial to remove the break of the immune system called checkpoint inhibitors and President Jimmy Carter is now cancer free. So in a nutshell, cancer immunotherapy actually works for different types of cancers and it's actually worked for adults and children. And there are many types of immunotherapy out there. So genetic engineered T cells was the one that Emily had. Checkpoint inhibitors was the one that President Jimmy Carter had. In Cancer Research Malaysia, we focus our research in developing cancer vaccine, mainly because this type of immunotherapy required only vaccination under the skin which is a technique that we can adopt in our clinical setting easily without investing a lot of money. And I'm going to tell you our workflow or effort in developing a vaccine in Cancer Research Malaysia. First, we have to identify the cancer cells and know what are the protein present in these cancer cells but do not present in normal cells. This is extremely important because we want to train your immune cells to recognize cancer cells only but not recognize normal cells, so they will kill cancer cells only and spare your normal cells. It will then give a lesser side effect for the patients who receive immunotherapy. Once we confirm the target, we will synthesize and develop the cancer vaccine. And this vaccine will underwent a lot of extensive experiment to make sure the vaccine actually stimulated immune responses and efficacious in control tumor growth before we can inject into the human. And in Cancer Research Malaysia, the vaccine that we were developed was actually a cancer vaccine against head and neck cancer. Why head and neck cancer? Because head and neck cancer is a type of cancer very prominent in Asian populations, but we rarely heard about head and neck cancer in other regions of the world, mainly due to the risk factors that are very unique to the Asian populations. And majority of head and neck cancer patients actually develop recurrence in two years after the first diagnosis, and they actually ran out of treatment options. We are very positive that if we are able to train the immune system of these patients to hunt out and fight against the cancer cells, we will be able to provide a patient with better clinical outcome. And most importantly, with the immune cells that are patrolling in your body, we will be able to prevent recurrences or even prevent the presence of a new cancer. For this particular project, we have completed the discovery. We have discovered two unique proteins that are present in head and neck cancer. We have designed and developed a vaccine and tested them in the laboratory, mod laboratory model and showed that this vaccine is immunogenic and most importantly, they control tumour growth. We are actually one step away from testing them in human being and first in human clinical trial is now planned in 2021. All the research development in Cancer Research Malaysia is trying to make sure that Asian and Asian cancer are not left out in the fight against cancer. 
I hope my presentation made you understand immunotherapy more. And if, if you do have any questions on cancer immunotherapy or on my presentations, you're welcome to leave it at the bottom and I will attend to it later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gui Ping. Um, I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Annie Chai to begin her presentation on CRISPR-Cas9. Um, Dr. Annie is a postdoctoral scientist at Cancer Research Malaysia. Her research has focused on using gene editing technology to identify critical genes that govern, that govern the survival of head and neck cancer cells, uh, which could represent uh, promising therapeutic targets. Uh, welcome, Dr. Annie. My name is Annie and today I would like to talk to you about how we use gene editing technology to fight Asian cancers. If you have any questions for me, please do leave it in the chat box below. So in Cancer Research Malaysia, one of our main research focus is on the head and neck cancer. More than half of the incidence and mortality worldwide of head and neck cancers actually happen among Asians. Sadly, we already know that there's limited benefit from existing treatment options for the patients. That includes from the surgery, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy. So this is very clear that there is an urgent need for a better treatment that is more effective. And this included development of targeted therapy as well as immunotherapy. And one of the methods in Cancer Research Malaysia, how are we addressing this problem, is by harnessing a gene editing technology in order to help us identify better treatment options or better targeted therapy. So we know that there are about 20,000 genes in each cancer cells. The question to ask next is, which of these 20,000 genes is actually the important cancer genes that are keeping the cancer cells alive? So let me give you this analogy of the Jenga block, which I believe uh, many of you would have known. So just imagine every single uh, block is actually the genes in our cancer cells. And this whole tower is actually the cancer cells that have been kept growing. So the question to ask is, which of these blocks, when you remove it, could actually cause the whole tower to collapse? Or in our case, which of these genes, if you delete it, can actually cause the whole cancer cell structure to collapse or the cancer cells to die? It is very important for us to identify this gene because if we can identify the gene that kept the cancer cells alive, we could then develop a drugs that could inhibit the functions of these genes and hopefully that could actually kill the cancer cells. So in the next slide, I will talk to you about this CRISPR-Cas9 technology and I will walk you through uh, so that you can understand how this works. So this CRISPR-Cas9 technology is a gene editing technology that we have harnessed in order to do a screening in, 20, uh, in 21 oral cancer cell lines. And it consists of two components. One is the guide RNA, the yellow bits, which is actually a specific gene sequence that would help identify the gene that you want to delete. And the second component is actually the Cas9 enzyme, the red molecules, that is actually acting like a molecular scissors that will do the DNA cutting. So let me show you a, a small animations to explain how this works. So in the cancer cells, we will introduce a lot of these gene-specific guide RNA like here. And we will also be um, expressing the Cas9 enzyme in these cancer cells. So what happened is this gene-specific guide RNA would lead the Cas9 enzyme to make a specific cutting on the DNA. And when, you, when the gene is deleted, we will then examine what happened to the tumor cells. If the tumor cells die when you delete this particular gene, it means that this is a cancer gene that is very important that was keeping the cancer cells alive. So if we can identify these genes and study the functions of these genes, we could then develop a specific drug that could target these cancer genes and hopefully making it an uh, effective targeted therapy for the patient. However, in order to apply this gene editing technology, we need to have some unique cancer models. So we are lucky that we have surgeons and inf um, patients that are generous enough to actually donate their, patient tumor, uh, their tumor tissues for us to make them into a special models that we can study in the lab. So we receive a patient tumor from the surgeons after the biopsies. And this is passed on to the scientists where we will make them into a single cell suspension by further dissecting them. And we will then have to put them in a designated uh, culture flask like this and supplement them with uh, culture media that is rich in nutrients. And we'll also keep them in an incubator that is maintained at 37 degrees Celsius, 5% carbon dioxide, everything trying to mimic the human body environment so that these cells can be grown indefinitely in the culture, in the lab, and 
we can use it as a model to study our gene or study the drugs. So next one, I will show you the video on actually how does these cancer cells look like and how these uh, cell lines are being grown in the lab. Cancer cells are precious models that are derived from patients' tumour tissue. Outside of the human body, these cancer cells need to be maintained in 37 degrees Celsius incubator in a sterile container in the form of specially coated flasks or dishes and supplied with special nutrient solution to enable its growth. These cancer cells can't be seen by naked eyes due to its small size, so we have to monitor its growth and behaviour by viewing them under the microscope. In Cancer Research Malaysia, we have successfully engineered these cancer cells with the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing system to help us identify the critical genes for head and neck cancer. So now that you have seen how the cancer cells look like and how we grow them in the lab, I just want to show you some example of the images of um, uh, these two cancer cell lines that are also one of the 16 oral cancer cell lines that were made in Cancer Research Malaysia itself. So thanks to the patients, we have actually built the largest panel of unique Asian oral cancer models that enable us to study the oral cancer better. And we are proud to say that we have sent these cell lines to more than 20 laboratories worldwide to about nine different countries, including Taiwan, India, Japan, and so on. This is very important because these unique cancer models uh, serve as a very precious model for us to study cancer itself and also to study the functions of the genes and also to test the drugs. So in the next video, I will show you how we use these cancer models again to study uh, the efficacy of the drug and the toxicity of the drug. Before a new treatment can be brought to test in human clinical trial, a comprehensive preclinical testing is essential. In Cancer Research Malaysia, we identified new drugs and compounds that can be potentially used to treat oral cancer and test them for its efficacy and toxicity using the cancer cell lines we described earlier. For instance, cancer cells are seeded in the plate and treated with drugs at various dosage, after which we can then use some biochemical assay and equipment to help us assess how well is the cancer cells responding to the drug. So now that we have walked you through how Cancer Research Malaysia makes use of these unique cancer models from Asian patients, as well as the cutting-edge gene editing technology, I hope that I've convinced you we have identified uh, methods or approach to actually identify cancer genes that we could act upon and identify drugs that could actually use to target these actionable genes. It is our aim to find the precision medicine to be able to match the right drug to the right patients with a specific genetic alterations. And with this, we hope that it can maximise the treatment benefit for all the head and neck cancer patients. So I hope that uh, with my talk, you have better understanding of what we do in Cancer Research Malaysia. And we hope that we have convinced you that our research aims to ensure Asians are not left out in the fight against cancer. And I hope that you could join us in this journey. Thank you. Welcome to Cancer Research Malaysia, where scientists are on a mission in finding ways to prevent, detect, diagnose, and cure cancer. Our areas of work include cancer genetics, genomics, immunology, translational biology, and clinical trials. Our experiment helps us to find what has gone wrong in cancer cells. We have developed one of the largest collections of oral cancer cell lines derived from our patients. These help us to develop and test new drugs for oral cancer. The use of specialized instruments helps us understand the patient's immune system for the development of cancer vaccines.
we have established the largest breast cancer biobank in the region and we lead on the Asian research of major breast cancer studies. Our scientists are committed to conduct impactful research here in Malaysia so that the fight against cancer do not miss Asians, especially Malaysians. We are on a mission to reverse the big C. Thank you for those wonderful presentations. Um, uh, our team is also compiling a list of uh, all the questions that we have received today, and we will find another way to sort of address these questions um, either through our social media handles or our website um, and even our monthly free newsletter. Uh, so do follow us um, on, on social media. Um, I believe some of the links have been pasted in the chat box for your convenience. Uh, thank you once again, dear panelists. Uh, we will now show a short video before we invite uh, PK for his closing remarks. Thank you very much. Did you know? 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 Did you know that cures for some cancers do exist? There are over 200 different types of cancers. And some of them are already curable. You could say that researchers have found a way to reverse cancer. But it didn't happen overnight. I survived cancer. I survived cancer. I survived cancer. I survived cancer because of medical research done yesterday. I believe. I believe. I believe. To cure more types of cancers tomorrow, we need to do more research today. 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 We are Cancer Research Malaysia, a non profit medical research organization working to reverse cancer in as many ways as we can. In the world of cancer research, there isn't enough. There isn't enough. There really isn't enough focus on Asian genetics and the cancers that are common here. We are ensuring that the fight against cancer doesn't miss Asians, especially Malaysians. Especially Malaysians. Like you and me. Like you and me. But we need your support. We need your support. We need your support. Because we are funded entirely by donations. We are already working on vaccines to prevent some cancers. Our scientists are using genetics to sharpen diagnosis and therapy. New ways to make treatment more accessible to patients. Projects to reuse existing drugs in new and more affordable ways. Mobile technology to speed up screening. In remote locations. We have started this fight. We have started this fight. But there's so much more we can do. Talk to us. And find out how science can reverse cancer for our future. And the future of our loved ones. And please donate to ensure we finish this fight. We are Cancer Research Malaysia. And we are reversing cancer through research. Thank you for staying with us. Uh, I hope the last one and a half hours has been an eye-opener for you. Uh, I'm certain that uh, you now know more about cancer and also Cancer Research Malaysia. Do you know that more people die of cancer than COVID-19 every day? Not only in Malaysia, but worldwide. Although a lot more people die of cancer, yet the attention given to the fight with the cancer seems much lesser than COVID-19. We have been working with Cancer Research Malaysia since 2015. Sometimes people ask me, why do we support Cancer Research Malaysia? And for how long will we continue to do so? We support Cancer Research Malaysia because we believe this group of scientists and their ability to deliver results through impactful research. Like what I said earlier, although we are not scientists or doctors, we can contribute in the war to fight cancer. We have, lost many, <clears throat> we have lost many friends and family members to cancer. We will continue to lose more if we do nothing. We want to be free of fear of cancer. It is possible to cure cancer. My mom was diagnosed to have bowel duct cancer five years ago. Doctor removed her cancer tumor. 70% of her liver you know, were removed. She has recovered fully. Likewise, for my fourth uncle and my fourth auntie, both of them were diagnosed to have kidney cancer and lung cancer a few years ago, and they are okay now. All these three elders in my family are now in their 80s. We believe many more such happy endings for people diagnosed to have cancer can happen to more people. 
We are now he helping Cancer Research Malaysia to set up their crowdfunding platform and invite public to support. NGO like Tsuji Foundation, World Vision, and National Kidney Foundations have received tremendous financial support from the public. These NGO have raised millions, mainly millions of ringgit every year to fund their activity. We believe Malaysian public will also support Cancer Research Malaysia if more people know about the work done by them. We choose to start this initiative not because it is easy, but because it is very important. I told Professor Teo that supporting Cancer Research Malaysia is my life mission. I will continue until the last day of my life. This is a very meaningful mission that worth spending a lifetime. So what is our plan and how can you help? We hope to get 1,000 company, each donating 1,000 ringgit every year to Cancer Research Malaysia. It is not difficult to get company to, do to donate 1,000 ringgit every year, but the bigger challenge is to get this 1,000 company. We also look for 5,000 individuals, each giving us only 100 ringgit every year. If we can achieve this, you know, we will be able to raise 1.5 million ringgit every year for Cancer Research Malaysia. This will be very useful. Our scientists can do a lot more to find cures and reverse the big C earlier. There are three roles or three ways that you can play here. You can be a donor, a promoter, or a champion. As a donor, you or your company can support us. Only give us 1,000 ringgit. If you have one company, give us 3,000 if you have three companies. On personal level, you and your family members can support us Ringgit Malaysia 100 every year. So 1,000 Ringgit for a company or 100 Ringgit for an individual is not too much for us, is it? Although large amount of donation from company um, and high net worth individuals are very useful, but small money from public is also very important. And this is much more sustainable. Okay, secondly, you can be our promoter. Help us to promote Cancer Research Malaysia and get us donor, both company and individuals. We need plenty of promoters. Thirdly, I hope you can be our champion. Champion that give us both financial support and spare their time to promote Cancer Research Malaysia and help us to get more donors and promoters. We need a lot of donors, promoters and champions. We can make this world a better place if all of, all of us work together. You help me, I help you. Ladies and gentlemen, instead of doing it later, you can now fill in the form and donate immediately. Later, we will share uh, here what you can, how, how you can make uh, your contribution. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, we hope to get your very, very strong support. Um, definitely, each and every one of us can make a difference to fight cancer. Thank you very much and take care. Um, thank you, PK, for sharing your personal experience and also for your kind words of encouragement through the crowdfunding campaign. Um, I believe that this is uh, truly a sustainable plan uh, that will allow the organization to continue uh, its work in reversing the big C into a small one. Um, the link to the crowdfunding um, form uh, can be found on the screen in front of you, the QR code in the middle. If you scan that QR code, it will bring you to the cancerresearch.my slash crowdfunding page, uh, where you can pledge your support to the organization and the fight against cancer. Um, on behalf of Cancer Research Malaysia, we hope that you've had a good experience with us today at this virtual lab tour, uh, just as much as we enjoyed hosting you this afternoon. Uh, the team has also posted a link to a feedback form. Uh, the QR code is on the screen as well. Uh, we would really appreciate if you could take three minutes of your time to visit the feedback form um, and leave a note, a comment uh, for the speakers, um, and also tell us um, uh, with your suggestions of how we can improve. Um, if, if the form is anonymous, but uh, if you're okay with leaving your phone number and your name, you can actually uh, enter yourself into a small little fun contest that we are hosting uh, where you can win some exclusive Cancer Research Malaysia merchandise.
um, please do also follow us on social media and subscribe to our monthly free e-newsletter. I believe that link should be in the feedback form as well. Um, our November e-newsletter will be coming out at the end of the month uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, so do keep a lookout for some really interesting content uh, that's going to be coming out uh, from our editorial team. Uh, once again, uh, on behalf of Cancer Research Malaysia, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we wish you a pleasant evening um, and a wonderful week ahead.